IT security for the last five years or something. Um, and I've um, started crypto in the early 90s. I never really stopped with that. And um, I'm going to show you a couple of things that now, due to Mr. Snowden's revelations, we, um, we should think about a few things. And the funny thing about this talk is this is, this is marketing speak. I think none of the slides uh, refers to anything about of uh, Snowden's revelation, actually. Or mostly what we see that Snowden has been uh, telling us. So the very first thing that I want to show you um, is a quote from John Callas, uh, who is one of the authors of PGP and Silent Circle. And uh, John Callas talks about security elements. The security person, me, or someone else, is telling you what your threat models will be. I'm going to show you a threat model soon. Don't worry. So I'm going to engage in some security arguments. And I'm, um, I'm also using military words like civilians. Uh, <laughs> but this is because our adversaries are also in their own military. You know? um, so let's introduce first a security arrogant person besides me, Mr. Cory Doctorow, <laughs> who tells people after Snowden that actually governments are seeing their own citizens and persons as adversaries. And this inspired me to, to the 4C adversary model, where the first adversary, as Corridoctory also notes, is the civilian. Then you have the classical adversary, which we are all aware of, and that there are antivirus industry for threat protectors of. These are the ordinary criminals, mostly Romania, Ukraine, and you know, and, uh, Maybe it's not Hungary, not so much, because in Hungary we have, a lot, we have good paying jobs for all the good hackers, so they don't have to engage in criminal activities, unfortunately. Uh, then you have actually corporate adversary. I, I think of Google, I think of um, Facebook and all these others. These are actually adversaries. And then the fourth C um, is, is, is country. And in this totalitarian system that we're living now, here we have the fourth uh, C so as a, as a simple adversary model, and I'd like to point out that actually the bottom three, if they are polluting, that is called fascism, in the classical sense of the world of the 40s in Italy. This is the organized crime corporations and the government went against the civilians, and the civilians were duped into nationalism to support the fascism, actually. But this is just a side note. I'm sure there will be more about this topic later on. Uh, so let's have a look at the history. How did we get here, right? Uh, how did, uh, what did, what did, what, what does Snowden wants to tell us that we actually kind of knew already? So this is like 30 years ago, a quote from uh, the New York Times, um, talking uh, uh, secretive intelligence agency of the United States National Security Agency might now fully intercept the overseas communications of Americans even if it has no reason to believe they are engaged in illegal activities. This is exactly the same thing that we're having now. This is 30 years ago, okay? So, 20 years ago, there is this fantastic NSA publication that is completely secret. But a couple of years ago, a couple of these publications have been, through FOIA requests, freed up, and they are available to us. This is totally unrelated to Mr. Snowden. This has been FOIA. And Cryptolog is, a, is an exciting insight into the working of this military organization, which is the NSA. And here's a quote from uh, 93. There was a Europe conference of cryptographers in Hungary. And uh, the NSA person visiting this conference is actually extremely happy that even though the scientific work is uh, very exciting, but has no relevance for the NSA. They do not feel threatened by current, like 20 years ago, cryptographic um, um, research in, in the world. So. Um, I, I really love this uh, quote. It tells us 20 years ago what was the state of mind. I'm going to show you a couple of more quotes. Actually, uh, the first uh, three of the last four sessions have no value. I hope you all wonder what the word is for sessions. <laughs> Digital signatures, electronic cash, complexity theory, and I guess cryptography too is the one that they, he was interested in. Uh, but, the NSA is not interested in electronic cash, digital secret uh, signatures, which is, I think, pretty interesting. Um, there's another, okay, so there's another insight. Uh, he says, this could not have been any better for us. This was 20 years ago in Hungary, the biggest European crypto scientific conference, right? 
Let that soak in. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of arrogance here, right? Wow. And it's not security arrogance. So, um, oh, that's video. Um, I have a, I have an author. I'm sorry, <laughs> but there's there's a, there's a couple of persons who already like prove um, a lot to us and produce. This is like a bit of miracle and stuff. Maybe you believe this guy a bit more than me. Um, I hope the sound works. This is from uh, Midfield Diffie, who's the, one of the inventors of the Diffie Hammond key exchange. This is from the 70s. I hope it's very really strong. Yeah, it's, mm. it's laughing. You can see it up there. I said everything else is rotten. Uh, crypto implementation is, you know, somewhere from fair to dreadful in most things. Uh, when you hear about things being broken, it isn't, I say, invariably, because the, uh, the implementations have failures, either failures imaginative enough, you know, far-fetched enough, you shouldn't have noticed them to start with, or just plain blunders. And the key management, in particular the key production, is rather crummy. So this is my first quote. But, uh, uh, with the difference trying to tell us. It's actually, crypto is, is pretty cool. Like also what we can see from the quotes from the NSA guy, that there is a uh, crypto that can protect and that it protects against the NSA. It's most of the time different thing. This is something that is clear now also that we can see from all the Snowden revelations. But actually it turns out that many, many, many of our technologies have been subverted. The implementations have been subverted by our adversaries, the NSA or other people. Like, these are all crypto IDs. Like, I don't know if you know about the Crypto AG. The Crypto AG is a Swiss company that produces crypto hardware for all kinds of governments, but it, it has been uh, provably infiltrated by uh, um, agencies. And then this is a long list of all the, the technologies that we are using and trusting, and they all have been subverted by one or other agency. Um, uh, one of my favorite, Intel AMT. You do know that if you have AMT in your laptop or in your server, there is actually a, a complete total backdoor to your laptop. And, and all this, this is like, uh, this is a, a horrible list, I think, to, to look at. And then uh, going into a bit more detail, like SSL has been horribly broken a couple of times already. Um, there's, a, there's a small list of what happened in the last couple of years, like the last 12 years, 10 years. Uh, the second, uh, after the comma, is always how you can uh, protect against the attack. I'm not going into the detail of the attack, this is more for a cryptography conference. I'm going here for free software people, so I'm not going too deeply into this. But you can see there's, there's a lot of, of stuff uh, broken with SSL. Um, Instance. Yeah, so all these things that, that are broken, how do we react to that? I think um, it is important to note that our survival strategies have absolutely, have absolutely not adapted to this new world that we're living in. Uh, 
or the placebo. Also, uh, I think this is a, a beautiful example. All these people after the Snowden, Snowden revelations, we have a lot more PGP keys added since Snowden. Uh, this is a bit older, the longest, I guess, natural um, updates. But uh, PGP, right? Um, is this good? No, it's actually, I would like to argue against PGP. In NSA parlance, PGP, or the open PGP packet format, is a strong selector. Whenever you send a PGP, whatever, message, a sign, thing, without encryption, a key, whatever, it's all an open PGP packet. And an open PGP packet is a strong selector for the NSA, it's a strong selector for any forensic tool that you can use. If you use disk imaging, if you use uh, memory imaging tools, the very first thing that you get is extract PGP key material and extract PGP packets from whatever image I have. Second, there's no PFS. That means in the world of having a, a totalitarian, totalitarian adversary who's storing all the strong selectors. Could you, could you try avoid the PFS? Uh, PFS, perfect for the secrecy. Sorry. Uh, I'm going to ignore uh, yeah. So I'm trying to explain that. So uh, the adversary is storing all the messages until he gets access to your keys. And then he can retroactively read all your messages. And this is a very bad thing. And if you apply PFS, that is proper forward secrecy, uh, the adversary needs to compromise each and every separate key for each and every message because you use a new key for every message. Currently, when you use PGP, you always use your own private, secret, uh, and public key pair. And that means that whenever your private, public, uh, your private key pair is compromised, the adversary gets access to all your previous communication, and you don't want them. Also, there's no authenticated encryption if you do symmetric encryption. Like, you can do symmetric encryption with PGP, but it doesn't protect you against tampering inside. There's an MVC algorithm which is uh, I'm not going into that, but I, I don't really am satisfied with that. Um, this is also true, actually, for, for OpenSSF. Uh, and there's still no ECC, this is elliptic curve cryptography, which I'm going to show you a bit later. Uh, they have PGP, uh, GPG, I'm sorry, GPG has elliptic curve cryptography implementations for at least one and a half years in the source code repository, and it's not being released. Um, Although, I will show you later, I, have, I, I would like to argue in favor of ECC crypto. And then, the, as another strong selector is key IDs. You use key IDs in all your packets where you say, who is the, the recipient of my packet, of my uh, encryption? There's a lot of metadata that we're sending along with your encryption. This is all very bad because this is all healthy encrypt analysis, etc., etc. So, I would like to argue against PGP now and for the future until these things are not being fixed. And I think it's pretty hard to fix fixed open PGP packet format, for example, without completely changing it. Um, so um, we should be very careful and maybe consider PGP only a, a mid-level security tool or something. So then another tool that is like I'm very dissatisfied with is, uh, is Firefox. If you there's no real compartmentalization, there's no TLS 1.2 support, this is the only SSL protocol that is still unbroken. I showed you earlier all the list of why SSL is broken, and TLS 1.2 is the only one that is not broken so far, and Firefox still doesn't support it. So when you use Firefox, you actually use a browser um, that is a, 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 a very nice target. And then sign builds. How do you know? Uh, I'm going to show you another uh, exciting thing that is called an infection proxy. But basically, when you're not using like a distribution that download, for example, Firefox from getfirefox.com or Skype or something, then you need to verify whether the binary that you download is actually the binary that Firefox produced and is not infected, not compromised, doesn't contain any malware. So actually, we need signed builds to, to verify this. Um, I tried to uh, get the, uh, the signature of a Firefox build, and this is what I get at getfirefox.com, https getfirefox.com, I get this warning message. This is so hostile that actually, if you want to be sure that the binary that you downloaded is not backdoored, you get this warning message. And as a, as some, as a civilian who has not been trained in this, you are going, oh shit, I'm not going to touch this, right? 
Uh, and then if you say, yeah, I understand the risk, etc., then you get to a completely different uh, server that has nothing to do with, with Firefox. Um, actually, it's a completely misconfiguration. Um, very bad. Um, so Firefox needs a lot of stuff to, to work on. Jitsi, Pigeon, what you are doing like communication, chat apps, both of them are, uh, Pigeon always blows up in all of our faces when some of the guys do uh, security audits. And uh, the Jitsi, there's also, I need to tell you, this very bad thing, they, they have OTR, OTR is off the record uh, encryption, and this is actually a, a system that provides perfect for secrecy, so I would like to um, recommend all of you that if you do something sensitive, stick to OTR for that PGP. Uh, but this is an interactive thing, you need, both parties need to be online, but uh, I think this is the highest level of security that we can get in, in direct communication between peers and peers. Uh, peers, peers. The Jitsi, there's a problem. Jitsi actually contains uh, an OTR implementation that predates the OTR specification. Uh, they never touched it afterwards, and I think there's also a lot of understanding of, of, of these cryptographic protocols. But for example, then there's a bug uh, report that the socialist millionaire protocol should be implemented, which is good for identifying each other over an encrypted channel, they say, but you can verify fingerprints. But then I say, no, but because the people I care about, they usually use TAILS, which is a system that doesn't store anything. So whenever you start a system, it generates a new set of keys. So you cannot compare the key from yesterday because it's a completely new key. So you need another way to ensure that the party that you're communicating with is actually the party you want to communicate with. So both of these uh, applications um, need a lot of work. So if anyone cares about these, please do. Um, voice and video, the list is empty, I don't trust that. I don't think uh, you can do voice or video in a secure way, uh, because there's always going to be uh, traffic analysis, there's always going to be all kinds of attacks against these very low latency, because you know, voice and video needs low latency. And low latency means uh, you need to make a compromise and uh, leave a lot of security things behind and uh, I have not seen yet. There's a lot of, you know, silent circle and all these people are promising you encrypted communication. Yeah, it's encrypted, but I'm not British, but you know, there's still the metadata that we are communicating and all this stuff that we're in contact. So, um, it depends on, on, a, on a, with your family or if you care about criminals and the 4C model, uh, voice and video is okay, but if you have corporate or um, governmental adversaries, voice and video will not cover. So all these reactions that you have seen from uh, civilians are against an unforgetting, lawful, in quotes, hyper-resourceful adversary. And we need to be aware of that. And I think Snowden is doing a good job of at least telling, uh, showing this to people that this is actually the case. Um, but we should be aware of that, that if you're talking about corporations and governments, this is definitely the case. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really, it's totals all the way down, but, <laughs> But um, let's see what happens if you actually engage in this game. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an arms race, actually. Whenever you start to defend yourself against an attack, the attacker will shift the attack surface and try again and again. So this is the basic outcome. Uh, this is where we start. You have a non-encrypted connection between two parties, and the adversary is just got in the middle and intercepting and doing whatever he wants in, a, in an unprotected way. Second, you do encryption between the two parties. Uh, the adversary is still looking at the communication because there's still metadata in there and stuff like that. But now, um, the adversary shifts its attention from the communication to your end hosts, to your endpoints, where the communication is unencrypted in plain text. So that means from the point on, from the point on, when you uh, start encrypting, that point is the point when your host is under, starts being under attack. And I want to ask you about your host security. Anyone confident about his host security? I am not. Not you are. I am not. Let me do my uh, host security. So, uh, this is the thing that I, this is the infection proxy. This is a slide from the WikiLeaks spy file 3. An infection proxy is basically a proxy that is installed into your infrastructure that you are internet service provider, Telia or whatever, uh, in Hungary we definitely have this, uh, it basically is a proxy that intercepts all your downloads and whenever they see something that they can infect, it will be automatically infected with uh, backdoor or hardware, 
for YM. And so that means if you have an activist or someone who downloads the newest Skype, because you know, we need to Skype to communicate with each other, um, this infection proxy actually, ah, Skype, I know how to infect that. And it tags on a malware Trojan. And then your, your, uh, your uh, activist is actually backward from that point on, and the host and the communication. And it's, it's pretty cheap, actually, this product. Um, um, look at this file, you will see there's a lot of countries besides Hungary and Turkmenistan, for example. But also there's like Switzerland, and there's a couple of great um, contracts that you can look up where there's already exclusive contracts going on between the company and the country, etc. So if you go further, then you see that it's not only those two parties that are communicating, but you leak a lot of information because my, my encrypted message might be sent forwarded to some other people without, without encryption. So my message can be intercepted. I'm on the left side, perhaps, I guess. So my message can be intercepted all the way on the right side with all these peers that are there. And they don't use this encryption and they forward my message unencrypted. This is very bad. And then, of course, this is only the communications. We also affect the endpoints, right? This is a totalitarian adversary. Um, we're talking to but There's no things. First off, uh, two rules of thumb. If it's proprietary software, forget it. If you don't have access to the source code, don't use it. Skype is one of those good examples. Do not use it. We have no way of verifying what is in there. And the other one is if it's running in your browser or phone. And with these two rules of thumb, uh, you actually eliminate, uh, the first rule eliminates 90% of the snake oil, and the second rule eliminates the rest of the 90% the, the of the rest that remains. Uh, yeah, no, the 90% of the remaining 10% that you have left, how much? I don't know. 90%. Right? Okay, really nice. But it's, it's, it's much better than you can math, right? I'm going to get some, to some higher level math later on. So, um, <laughs> you need to understand something else about this. And this is, again, I'm, I'm asking for the help of Liffy. Uh, Liffy. Uh, what was it called? It's A layer that says, you know, yeah, I get there if I can. And similarly, I'm not suggesting that you can't do secure things within the internet, but I'm suggesting that the internet itself can in no more meaningful sense be secure than maybe, you know, than the oceans are secure. There are security activities in the oceans, there is law of the sea, there are many aspects of it, but the functioning of humanity has depended on the openness and diversity of the seas, and I think it depends similarly on the openness and diversity of the internet, with the incredible difference, of course, that we didn't, we didn't build the seas, and we are building the internet. Right. So, insecurity is inherent in generative media. We need that. We actually we should actually be happy that the internet is not safe. And we should keep that sort of way. So here's a few, few thoughts about operational security. First off, what we first need to learn about security is not even military is able to keep their own organization secure. If NSA fails, all the military fails, in every history of every war, you see huge OPSEC failures from both sides of the, of the fight. Um, so, how, and these people are in a hierarchical structure with discipline, with, with punishment, and stuff like that, right? And even those people are not able to keep the discipline and to keep security and do OPSEC correctly. This is, this is something that we need to understand. We, as hobbyists, it's, you know, even they can't do that. The second one is uh, threat analytics. You need to be aware, um, I think, I've showed you the 4C model. I think this is already a good start into expanding your horizon. It's not the Ukrainian spam bot operators that, that, are, that should be occupying all your, your horizon. Um, 
You should also be, <coughs> this was also addressed, physical and psych psychological security is extremely important. Uh, this is also something, as also healthcare that you were referring to, this is also part of the psychological uh, security part. If you don't feel secure, if you don't have uh, confidence, then it's very hard to actually uh, uh, operate in a secure way. And then, I always say security is a trade-off. No, it's not. It, I always uh, do this comparison to hygiene. I brush my teeth not because I enjoy it but, or because I, it's hip, but because I have a long-term investment into this. It is uh, preserving my health. And exactly the same is with security. With all these chores that take some time and are inconvenient are not because they're hip. I don't enjoy them myself. I really hate some things that I need to do because I, uh, I also care about the people that I, I try to protect. It's hygiene. It's like brushing my teeth every day. This is not, not cool. This is not convenient, but I still do it. And this is this is something we need to understand. This is like hygiene. And then question everything, especially like this is like the question of can I have access to the source code? You tell me this is the algorithm, okay then I check the algorithm or I trust someone who checks it for me and then uh, so and I think this lab, this next one is also extremely important. This is a, a game theoretical approach to security. As an attacker, I always look for the weakest link. And I have to find it only once, and when I do that, I succeed. As a defender, I have to defend all the way. And when I and, and if I don't defend everywhere, there will be a small hole, a weakest link, and then I will fail. I can I, as a defender, I cannot ever succeed. As an attacker, I can only succeed. This is a huge, huge difference. Difference in, in, in these two um, uh, <coughs> roles. Uh, there's never 100% in this process. So that means that as soon as you start doing your stuff, it's an arms race. Your attacker, your adversary is going to adapt to you. And you need to adapt to your adversary. Um, so it's never over. Um, this is another, besides the C's, a nice other, uh, uh, another one. Um, there's things that need, need training, right? Not only in military. Um, and it happens if you don't do that. So I was telling you about full security. First thing that I want to, to, to tell you is that current full security that we have, I would never store any of my keys on even on my laptop. Not even, like, I'm not talking about the unupdated Windows laptops of the people that I meet, or, or the Mac, um, Macs or whatever. Um, it's, uh, like, it goes down, as I said, also it still goes all the way down, you know, core boot. Is the only BIOS where we can actually um, verify what it's doing, and you can run your own BIOS. This is like the, the cure to the inter AMT stuff, or well, it's not running the BIOS, so uh, it's a good, uh, good stuff. So think about your your uh, your BIOS suite. Uh, then you need pro. I, I'm actually very much advocating proactive security through the Linux GR security and Fox, uh, um, patches for the Linux kernel. Which is which is a horrible experience for you if you if you never have seen uh, Linux kernel use in the last three years or something because with uh, Pax it's a proactive uh, patch set that when you have a sec faulting root process it actually halts your whole kernel and this happens to me quite a lot because we have very crappy software running on our systems. Um, then the next one is full disk encryption. Um, it's full disk encryption because you know most of the time we always have an unencrypted boot partition where I can store my Trojan and when you enter your full disk encryption password, I store it and send it off to myself. So full disk encryption is actually uh, something that you need to be very careful for. So the solution to that is actually to have your boot partition on, on a USB key and always on you, so it cannot be compromised, right? Um, so everything on my hard disk is completely important. Uh, data minimization is, is the next thing that you need to be very, um, uh, is very important. Do not collect the data that you do not want to leave. It's, so it's that simple. And then Tails is a, is a good example for such an operating system, which is based on Debian. And it's actually an operating system that uh, never stores anything. When you boot, it forgets everything that you've done before. It always starts from a clean. Uh, you won't have a history that can uh, uh, get you into trouble. You won't have cookies. 
you don't have tax files that are, can be used as evidence against you. This is really important. And then, of course, again, the, to the first point again, going back, use your key material in external devices. And in a, in a device, diverse uh, setting of, of devices, if possible, you know, diversity is very good. Um, so, I think this is the last segment from Mr. Richard. in these to 2005 is 90 years. Algorithms are in good shape, but everything else isn't. So, you know, what, why are algorithms in good shape? Well, like I said, we've been working on them for 90 years. Important point, we'll get back to it in a second. Um, but I'm pretty convinced that cryptography hasn't saved the world the way I and some other people thought it would only 40 years ago, um, it is not because the algorithms aren't good. Mm -hmm. No, the algorithms are actually pretty cool. I'm going to show you a couple that I like. <laughs> so first of all, a couple of building blocks and a lot of abbreviations. I'm going to explain them. So um, crypto building blocks that we should be a little bit more careful about. First up is authenticated encryption. So when you do like the myth of the one-time path, right? Everyone knows the one-time path is good crypto. The problem is it is a mailable crypto system. That means without decrypting the, the stream, I can alter uh, the contents of the encrypted uh, stream uh, if I know parts of, of, of known plaintext in the stream. And you will not be able to detect that. So for doing this, we need some kind of authentication that actually checks that this stream has not been cor uh, corrupted by someone like me. And then there's this, this other thing, this is authenticated encryption with associated data. This is like the, we tag on uh, a Mac, an HMAC, on the beginning of the encrypted stream. And this is something that is quite lacking. This is, I've checked in, I've checked in OpenSSL. It doesn't support this. There's, there's algorithms if you, if you uh, list the supported algorithms. It gives you algorithms that promise this kind of stuff, but if you try it out, it doesn't work. It is open as well, not from the common line. I'm sure it works in the browser or something, uh, but not particularly. The same is true also for PGP. Second, perfect forward secrecy. I already told you about that. In PGP, it's non existent. In open SSL, there's um, Wide variants there, the protocols are supported, but um, you, the deployment is, is quite lacking. The third one is uh, password authenticated key exchanges for doing all kind of uh, exchanges of keys so we can encrypt or further our communication. So, um, third one is uh, key derivation functions. I'm sure you have all heard about uh, all these PHP tools that store passwords in a simple hash, and then we have uh, services online, right? Uh, like Google, where I input a hash and they have all pre calculated these hashes already, so I get immediately back the result what is actually a password behind that. And with proper key derivation functions, it is extremely uneconomic to actually create such uh, pre computed databases of hashes. And this means that uh, brute forcing any kind of password or something like that is, is becoming completely uneconomic current to, to the current knowledge. And we have zero knowledge systems. Uh, one of my favorite ones is uh, Freecoin here because it actually uh, seems to deliver the anonymity that the Bitcoin network promises but doesn't deliver. Um, but according to Mike, uh, the Bitcoin developers have anonym the anonymity is not high priority on their development list. So it, it's, we will see how fast um, Freecoin will be integrated. Is it Freecoin? It's zero coin. It's zero coin. I, I changed this. What's I, the I changed this into zero coin. It should be zero coin, not Freecoin. Well, somebody has changed it for you without you know. Then there's exciting stuff that you can do with multi-party calculations where actually there's cryptographic protocols where we can share secrets so that none of us has the complete secret and none of us can compromise the secret but we still can do secure communications with that. I have one of the uh, solutions that I have, well, one of the things that I'm uh, experimenting with is actually that we create a certificate authority 
that is uh, decentralized across the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, we have one person in each of these countries with a share of a shared RSA key. So whenever someone wants to come and uh, uh, wants his certificate signed by us, then all of us must agree and sign this certificate at the same, we need to be online interactively. But that's the only uh, limitation. And then we can sign this key in a way that makes it actually extremely hard to compromise the CA behind that. If you uh, remember back the SL uh, debacles, like Turk Trust, Didi Nota, and all these other CAs that have been compromised, it would be much, much more difficult in such a decentralized setting where you have to take control of four, at least four persons in four uh, completely different jurisdictions. And then I'm extremely excited about the Kram and Shoot protocol, which I'm not going to explain to you now. Uh, this is cryptographic, but it's. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to. Um, I, I release a set of PDFs as well with my slides. And there's the uh, paper, the scientific paper, uh, also about this Kram and Shoot system. So if anyone is into crypto and math and stuff like that, you can read up on that. So also what Diffy. Uh, Diffy said is uh, key management as one of the top priority uh, topics that we need to care about. First off, RNGs, right? I'm going to refer back to Debian and Sony in the next slide. But remember, RNGs are extremely important. Uh, what are RNGs? Sorry? What? Random number generators, I'm sorry. Ah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Random number generators. Random numbers are the, are the, the basis of all crypto that we do. Ephemerals are keys that are very short lifetime, so we need to manage somehow short lifetime keys. You know, when we do a key signing party here, that is not very short lifetime, right? Uh, it doesn't really scale up. Uh, so we need to think about ephemerals, then we need to think about also the complete life cycle of a key, like what happens if I lose my key? What happens if I break the hardware device when I store my key? How do I revoke that? How do I tell people? Or how do I... Uh, um, this is all stuff that we actually do not very much uh, think about. Um, how do you delete keys, right? If you, if you look at uh, current technology, um, flash devices, it's extremely difficult to delete stuff from flash devices. Uh, actually, it's pretty impossible. Um, access, how do you access the key? Who has access? How do you prevent access? What is the size of the key, you know? If you're talking about an RSA key, it's, uh, it's one kilobyte long in bits, uh, bytes. It's, it's a one kilobyte, four, 4096 RSA key is uh, a bit smaller than that. Um, and then there's a very nice topic. Uh, we need to reverse engineer some of the algorithms, or all of the algorithms actually that we use, because it is possible to create an algorithm, a cryptographic algorithm, that is completely compatible with all the other uncompromised algorithms, like implementations of the same algorithm, but I am able to leak key material without you noticing or without you ever having a chance of noticing just by uh, investigating the output. This is called kleptography. This is where I backdoor the cryptographic algorithm where, for example, it says generate a random number and send that. Instead of generating a random number, I actually uh, create a special random number that looks like random for anyone else who doesn't have access to some secret key material, but whoever has access to that key material will be able to decrypt all your communication without you ever knowing if you do not reverse engineer um, uh, the stuff that you're using. I also have packaged the uh, <coughs> paper and, and the, the, that I'm going to distribute. It's really exciting. Um, <coughs> kind of stuff. Uh, RNGs, random number generators. Two good examples, Debian, Sony. There's another example that is always happening. If you boot up a computer, it doesn't have enough entropy. Mm -hmm. So whenever you have like a, a Raspberry Pi, some little embedded device, and you boot it up and it wants to generate a secret key or something, it's, it's it doesn't, it's, it's not there. Then you have this, 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 actually this is a reference to a Snowden. No, no, it's not, because I knew that earlier. <laughs> so dual EC DRBG is a, is a NIST, National Institute for Standard Technology, US uh, standard. It has been uh, introduced by the NSA, and it has been extremely 
badly backdoored, so badly that uh, like half a year after the um, publication of this, uh, people already thought, what the hell, I can, uh, I, I, I can generate the same random numbers without your, your stuff. And I, it is, this is not a, so this, um, we have bad energies. And then we can back to actually uh, random number generators that look completely random for an outsider without reverse engineering what is happening behind. And this is, for example, the case with, with the Intel, Intel hardware has a random number generator included, but they do not release any kind of specs or whatever how you can uh, verify or, or measurement points where you can actually see what is happening inside. So if we, if we have a symmetric cipher in a counter mode, which is like a counter mode is simply you have one, two, three, four, and then you encrypt that as a message, and that's about it. And the output <coughs> is completely random to you. But since I know the counter starts with one, two, three, I simply can reproduce the same random number. So the solution is, of course, using continuously seeded random number generators. That means you have some source of entropy, like a thermometer, like, like timing data, like uh, analog random number generator, and all kinds of stuff. And, and then you, you mix it, and then you use it in a uh, cryptographic um, random number generator that you see with all this input, and then if you see it like every second or something, then it's pretty, I, I guess, much more secure. And then, of course, my favorite random number generators are uh, uh, role-playing game dice. If you have eight of the D16 dice, then with one roll, you have a AS. Who has 16 sided dice? Sorry, what? 16 sided Yeah, yeah, yeah. For role playing games, you have that. Not my generation. <laughs> you have know, played AD&T? I didn't play AD&T. You should no, play AD&T. Yeah. 16? Uh, and then you have a deck of cards. Actually, if you play poker, 50, 52 uh, cards in a deck of cards provide you with 218 bits of random entropy. Yeah, this is really cool. And then if you ever uh, uh, generated a, a, a PGP key, a big one, and you have weight, and they ask you to type on the keyboard and stuff, I recommend you to install Habergate. It's also in Debian. It is extracting entropy from uh, instruction timing in your CPU. That is, that is a, actually a pretty cool random source. OK. There's another, I have listed a couple of uh, entropy sources that I got from uh, all over the internet. Um, I'm going back to, to the NSA guy, the crypto log. He actually, there's a, there's a last uh, quote that I want to show you. Certain public key systems might be implemented more securely by using elliptic curves. <laughs> so actually, NSA says that elliptic curves, in 93, this was secret, right? Uh, that uh, elliptic curves are are superior to this crypto that we have first. And we are fortunate to have only two such talks in 93 on that conference. Um, so this is, this is um, the first one is the, the form of an elliptic curve in so-called uh, Edwards form. There's various forms for describing this. Is, these are polygons, right? And these are describing symmetric curves in a two-day space because you have x and y. Uh, and it's a, it's a symmetric curve, that means on the x uh, axis, you can mirror the whole thing. So you have some kind of ambiguity. And these are the two superior forms of describing elliptic curves. Uh, if, you, if you describe a curve in, this, in one of these forms, it's much easier to actually calculate the basis of the crypto that is the basis of, of elliptic curves. Elliptic curves are based on multiplication in a mathematical construct. The multiplication is not the thing that you think of, but if you have a, a zero element, an identity element, and then like a normal algebra, you can map the same operation and, and multiplication to this curve, and then you get points on the curve, and you have a point, and you can multiply it with an integer, and you get another point on the curve, and so on. And it, it always stays on the curve, basically. But implementing this multiplication is extremely difficult. Uh, it depends how difficult on what kind of form for describing the curve you use. And actually these two curves, or these two forms, are superior to the forms that are mandated by the National <coughs> Institute of Standards and Technology. They are based on the Wireless form. And these are hard to implement and provide a lot of problems. Also, uh, the, they have identifiable points, because most of the time, 
the data that describes a point on the curve is not a complete like 32 byte integer, but uh, always in some smaller interval. So if you uh, statistically uh, check out the messages you hear, <coughs> ah, this is an NIST uh, elliptic curve, blah, blah, blah. Also, uh, cryptographic constants. If you, you can, there's some constants that you need to define here. If you use the lowest one, like the smallest possible one, like in, in the Edwards curve 2515, uh, one of the constants is 9. And this is the lowest possible constant that you choose. Whereas if you go to the NIST curves, you have constants that are awesomely huge. They, someone had put a lot of effort into finding some, some special number. And there's no explanation behind that, why this number has been chosen. Of course, it comes from the NSA, right? Same with Bitcoin, actually. The yeah. The ECC and Bitcoin has coefficients that are... So this is what we call, actually, nothing of my sleep crypto. When you show all the constants, how they have been chosen, like for example, Daniel Bernstein has chosen some constants for his crypto from a mathematical textbook 60 years ago. But it is clear that 60 years ago, none of the people even had thought about the integer factorization and the discrete log problem. The integer factorization is the solution to uh, solving virus A. The discrete log problem is the solution to cracking diffie hellman and elliptic curves. Uh, in 10 years, this will happen, and this is this will be a future event. And then there's no PGP to go back, and there's no open SSL to go back there. So I think we should start working on the future. We should anticipate 10 years from now, post-quantum crypto. Uh, there's actually, the last one, code crypto, is actually an implementation that we can try out now. Code review everything, please. I'm, I know you're not quite hackers, and you don't, you need a special mindset for that, but uh, it's just, we need that. Deploy, if, um, there's a, I think I'm running out of time and uh, I'm going over to my uh, questions also. Well, here's a, you can check my slides, I'm, I'm finishing off. Uh, this last thing is I'm, uh, I'm going, uh, I'm working on a tool myself, I call it PPP. It's like a, a play on PGP, of course. Uh, you can try it out, it's difficult to fingerprint because it has absolutely no structure, it goes completely entropy. Uh, it has, of course, uh, authenticated encryption and symmetric. It uses uh, ECC wherever possible, and it has a couple of other nice uh, experimental features. Uh, for example, also PFS uh, support for like email encryption or, or something like that, if you want. Is that a pretty bad privacy? I have never defined the acronym. Ah. Make it up for whatever you want. Is that a multi-party encryption? Yes. Ah. Uh, and actually, I'm not only really working in Python on this, but I'm working also on a crypto device hardware. Uh, I'm, I'm in love with the CPU there. Uh, <laughs> this one. Um, I hope maybe sometimes uh, in the first half of next year, I can come out with a uh, proof of concept device where you can do a lot of really awesome crypto that is um, uh, actually pretty conservative but they never have heard an implementation like this before um, because they were based on, on this traditional uh, PKI X509 model or the PGP model and we need to get at that. And then there's this, these crackpots on all kinds of um, um, scientific um, um, release platforms. Uh, this is like more than a year old paper. And I have not seen any reference or um, um, anything to disclaim these, these, um, these claims. But actually this guy says that he can break um, factoring and polynomial time, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, it's an even bigger claim. <laughs> yeah. This is the future, right? Thank you.